Welcome to the official podcast. Eric Allen inside the studio here at One Jets Drive. And making an annual visit <laughs> to the Jets is NFL Network's Judy Batista. Great to see you. Good to be back. Really what, good. What is your itinerary in terms of the summer? Uh, I just got back from Latrobe, Pennsylvania with the Pittsburgh Steelers. A few days there. I'm here for a few days. And then I am going to Tampa to see old friend Todd Bowles. Yeah. And uh, then I'll be back and going to the Giants. And then probably just doing, you know, the sort of Northeast. I'll hit the Patriots for a day. I'll hit the Eagles for a day. Just see some people and get ready. And before you know it, the season starts. And you brought your daughter along. I brought my daughter. Grace is back there. Yeah. This, uh, so she's getting the firsthand account of exactly what mom goes through. Yeah, exactly. Um, so be nice. Yeah. Be, be gentle on the podcast. Um, <laughs> but yeah, you know, she gets to watch practice up close like we do. It's like, you know, it's cool. All right. So you said it's cool. What do you take from early in camp? What are you looking for when you're watching the guys on the field? And maybe even more importantly, you talk to a few folks after practice well look i mean in this case in the jets case we're all looking at zach right yeah. and and how he looks and that's what everybody is talking about um i talked to robert sala uh today after practice and i said you know how do you why do you think he's ready to make the step in in year two and he said you know we're because we're around him every day and like we hear the questions he asks and we see his body language and his confidence level uh, one thing that really struck me was when Zach told reporters yesterday that um, he feels like he can identify when he has made a mistake now. Like, he knows when he makes mistakes, and he knows how to fix them. And Sala was saying, you know, the, those are the special ones, the ones who in-game know when they've done something wrong, and before they even get to the sideline, they know how to fix it. Right. They don't even need a coach to tell them. They can fix it themselves. And he said, those are the special ones, and this guy's got the ability to do that. So... There's a ton of optimism. I, you know, we did a, we were on Good Morning Football this morning talking about the Jets, and I, I've been around the team a long time, and like there's there's real optimism that the team is ready to take a step forward here. What do the folks say on a Good Morning Football? Where's everybody's headspace in terms of what they actually can be? Because I think universally, everybody's looking at the roster, say they're definitely more talented. No question. But now it's taking that step from hey a 4-13 and 13 team to a team that is going to be in competition or they're going to be right there late in games. But how do you take that next step and learn how to win? I think that is the big question because I, I don't think there's any way you look at the roster and don't think that it is vastly improved from what it was two years ago. Um, it, I mean, it, it's almost a completely different team. And um, I think... I think everybody is sort of especially excited about this young nucleus of talent, particularly on the offensive side, because you think they can sort of come up together right. and develop together. But you're right. I mean, you have to then you have you have to do it. I mean, at some point you have to do it on the field and it can't just be about promise and expectations. You've got to produce on the field. And we'll see. I, I think we've talked about this before. I mean, the, the start of the schedule is tough, yep. really tough start to the season. But if they can, you know, make their way through that. The back half of the schedule is manageable. And so if they're playing meaningful games, you know, going into December, I mean, that's about all you can hope for in the NFL. They certainly should be, though. Don't yeah. you think so? I do. I think they're a much better team. And I think, you know, the, the defense should be much improved. Um, and and I think if they can stay in games, they if you have a confident quarterback who, you know, knows what he's doing a little bit better, then, I, then you can pick off some wins that way. And... Um, I go back to how he, how Zach was after he came back from the injury right. last year because to me that felt like two separate seasons, right? There was early season Zach where I am sure his head was spinning. I can't even imagine what it's like to be a rookie quarterback starting in the NFL. But then when he sat for those four weeks, I don't know if like it just slowed down for him or if he was able to sort of step back and see how, you know, see how things worked a little bit more clearly. But he was a different quarterback and he seemed more settled. He certainly seemed to be more in command. Right. Five touchdown passes, three running touchdowns, yep. only one interception. I mean, if that's where he's picking up from, that's a pretty good place to be starting from. Do you think nationally he's going under the radar? Not from an expectation perspective, just from a perspective that. 
here's a kid who's in New York, who's drafted number two overall, entering year two. And there's so many great quarterbacks in the National Football League. We know this, and we're going to talk about that. But it feels like everybody says, yeah, the Jets have gotten better. And there's a system familiarity. They did damage in free agency. Mm -hmm. They brought in guys who had that combination of their veterans, but they've also won. And then you go and ace the draft on paper. Everybody says the Jets did a great job in the draft. Just feels like nobody's talking about Wilson, which might be a good thing. Well, I think it's a good thing, period. I, I, I don't have any doubt it's better to fly under the radar. Um, I mean, look at some of the more high-profile quarterbacks who are maybe having not such great storylines develop yeah. around them right now. You don't want to be those guys either. Um, I do think that the draft, the, the Jets did a great job, and I think uh, that got a lot of national attention. Yes. I mean, I think that really people sort of sat up and said, okay, I mean, this is a much better roster. Um and, and I think it, now it's just wait and see, right? Wait and see until the games begin, and what does Zach look like? Does the offensive line come together the way you need it to come together? Does he develop a chemistry with Garrett Wilson right away? You know, they're just the things that you need to see in an offense to develop. I, I do think he's under the radar, especially because it was such a bonkers offseason for the AFC. Right. So much talent moved into the AFC. I mean, Russell Wilson did, you know, right? Tyreek Hill is in Miami, so everybody's talking about two. There was so much going on in the AFC that I do think they're a little bit under the radar, but I think that's okay, you know. Where, where are you in terms of second-year quarterbacks? We saw Mac Jones experience success in mm -hmm. New England. Some people have a projection that he's kind of at his ceiling where he's a finished product. I don't know. I'm not saying that's me. Mm -hmm. Trevor Lawrence, I mean, that was a picture well, of instability right. last year in Jacksonville. Yeah. I don't even know how you can evaluate him. And then Justin Fields... On paper, <laughs> Chicago could be in for a lot of growing pains again this year. Yeah. Um, well, Trevor Lawrence, I agree. I don't. I mean, it's almost to me like Trevor Lawrence is a rookie quarterback right. again this year. I mean, they're starting over. He's got all, all the ability in the world, <laughs> and now he'll finally have some stable, real professional coaching. And I think he'll. I think he'll look much better than he looked last year. Um, I don't know if Mac Jones is a finished product. I kind of doubt it. Um, I think he is a smart, everything I talk to about people is he is a really smart grinder. Belichick loves him. Yeah. I mean, you don't hear Belichick rave about players in public too often, and he did it this week. It's raved almost over about the him. top, though, isn't it? It was. He didn't talk like Bra he didn't I talk about well, Brady like that. I talked to somebody who said that, who said, you know, he definitely does love Mac Jones. Yes. That's that's legitimate. He also thought that the praise might have been, uh, you know, to sort of needle Brady a little bit because he never talked about Tom Brady that right. way. Um, I don't know. Do you think Bill Belichick has ulterior motives? I don't know. Um, but I do think he I do think he legitimately thinks Mac Jones is is the real deal. Um, uh, you know, and I, I don't know about Justin Fields. I agree the Bears could be in for a long one this year, but I certainly think Zach is well positioned. They have done more to help Zach Wilson than any other second year quarterback has had. Let's put it that way. Could you make the argument that the Jets have the best, second best talent roster in the top division. to bottom in the AFC East? Yes. Behind the Bills, certainly. I mean, the Bills are a Super Bowl caliber team. Yes. So that's a different conversation. But yes, I mean, frankly, the Patriots, I think, had a confusing offseason. Like, I'm not quite sure what to make of the offseason right. yet. And I think we sort of chalk it up to, all right, Belichick, you know, Belichick knows what he's doing and he'll make something of this and it'll be fine. And that may be so, but like, there were some. You know, I, I thought, like, they needed to do more to get fast on defense. They were sort of exposed mm -hmm. at the end of the year, and I'm not sure they did that. Did they put enough pieces around Mac to, to help him? I don't know. Um, but I do think the Jets – I mean, the Jets have overhauled the roster in the last few years. The Jets have a lot of talent on paper. And now it's just a question of getting it, you know, getting it together and how fast can it come together and – I will say this. Uh, Elijah Moore mentioned today yeah. about the Idaho trip, the famed Idaho trip, and he thought that was great, not just for the, yeah, they threw the football around, and that's all well and good, but the bonding and the chemistry, like, that went a long way. So that's important. So you buying into the culture here? Because all I the players the are culture. talking about it, and in, you, yes. you have talked to Robert Sala numerous times. Yeah, I definitely buy into the culture that 
I, like I love that Sala showed up wearing positive vibes only shirt because I and I was talking to CJ Uzama who's brand new and basically like don't come to him with the same old Jets thing he is not interested he said like every year is a new year and he came from a team that had a similar experience yes. right that had hit rock bottom and then came all the way up in the case of the Bengals came up really fast and he said, like, well, every year is a new year. Like, he does not want to hear the same old Jets. He doesn't care what happened in the past. He doesn't care how many years it's been. Like, you've got a young quarterback now. And if, if you don't have one of those, we know how bad it is. You do have one of those. Now the question is, how good can it be? It's been 11 years since the Jets made the playoffs. Oh we know goodness. that. That's talked right. about all the time. Yeah. You just came from Latrobe. What's it like in Pittsburgh going to a camp where – they not only expect winning, but they expect winning at an elite level. <laughs> yeah. Mike Tomlin's been, what, a head coach for 16-plus years, And I never think? had a losing season. Never had a losing season. So, But it's the flip side because there you get asked, like, why don't we go further in the playoffs more? I mean, like, it, the expectations are at a completely different level, right? I mean, this is like, why aren't you Chuck Knoll right. and winning four Super Bowls in six years? Um so the expectations are entirely different, but they are, you know, the Steelers are like the model of consistency franchise, right? I mean, they have their method of how they do it, and they're going to do it, um, and it works more often than not. I mean, the one thing Mike Tomlin always says is the standard is the standard. The standard there is, like, you make the playoffs. I right. mean, that's just, you know, they better make the playoffs. And the fact that they're in a transition year with a, you know, with a Hall of Fame quarterback just retired, and now you got a, you've got a, a full-on quarterback competition in training camp— Whatever, you're making the playoffs, right? You know, there's no time to take a dip and come back up. They're Pittsburgh. different people, completely different people. But do you see similarities in Tomlin and Salah? Maybe the way they approach players. Yeah, I think they're both straightforward. There's no, um, you know, there's no BS about them. They are straightforward. They, they love players, obviously. They love ball. Um, but they deal with people like they're adults, right? Like they don't... Right. They don't um, they don't belittle them. They treat them with respect, but they, you know, they treat people like adults. Like, these are the expectations. This is your job. Go do your job. Getting back to the division a little bit. We know the Jets are honorary members of the AFC North to start the season. <laughs> I know. Bizarre. Okay, because the Baltimore Ravens are coming here in week one. The Jets will go and face the Cleveland Browns in week two. Then the Cincinnati Bengals come here in week three. And then the, finally, they go see the aforementioned Pittsburgh Steelers in week four. But how critical is it for the Jets to make inroads in the division? We talk about the talent. There isn't that discrepancy between them, the Patriots, and the Dolphins no longer, no matter what you think about those teams. But still, the Jets did not win a division game last year. Yeah, they got to win division games. I mean, you've got to win games, and you've got to win division games. And I, I do think those games are winnable. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I'm not saying you got to go to Buffalo and beat the Bills. That's a tough assignment for anybody. But, you know, you, you got to – you can beat the Miami Dolphins, right? We don't know what they are. Like, we spent a lot of the offseason talking about Tyreek Hill and a new coach, and this is Tua, and he's finally got some weapons. Okay, but they're sort of the same thing. Like, they got to come together. Can they do it? On paper, they're better. Are they really better, though? We don't know. You should be able to beat the Miami Dolphins, and – you should be able to beat the New England Patriots. Like, you have to – these these are the steps you have to take, right? right? You – you have to take those steps. Yes, they should be able to do it. You mentioned Tyreek Hill. I know people get mad at me talking about him or bringing up his name again. I just wanted to ask you, do you think it could ultimately be, ultimately be a blessing in disguise that Jets actually didn't get Tyreek Hill? Just where the roster is right now. Well, not not uh, that you right. wouldn't want a Tyreek Hill on your roster, right. but, but in terms of what you would have had to give, to give up, up and then pay. Right. Interestingly, when I talked to Salah earlier, he made the point that teams that grow together uh, usually do better than that than teams that are put together, mm. meaning teams that you draft together and that come up together generally stay together and are more successful than teams that you put together in free agency. Um, I, I think given what you would have had to give up to get a Tyreek Hill, you probably got, a, you know, you got more. Um, by using those draft picks because they had such a good draft. Um, you know, you would like a Tyreek Hill talent, but, you know, you've also got to manage a Tyreek Hill kind of talent, and that's tough for a young quarterback because that's um, – you, 
you know, there's, because every one of your throws, every one of your right. long throws in training camp is going to be put out there on Twitter right. and Instagram and reels, right. and everybody's going to be saying, well, you underthrew him there. Exactly. I mean, the pressure on, I mean, look, Tua has pressure on him anyway and would have even if Tyreek Hill wasn't there. But the pressure on Tua to perform this year is going to be immense. I mean, this is his make or break year. It's going to be fun watching Mike McDaniel, too, because yes. I had Mike LaFleur up here in the seat you're at right now, and he loves him, swears by him. So does Sala. And obviously, that guy is a head coach for a reason, but just an interesting situation that he's walking into. He's like a fascinating guy. First of all, he's like sort of quirky and funny, yeah. like in a way that you don't usually see NFL coaches be. He's also got the running game background, which I think is going to be really interesting. And they signed uh, uh, like a zillion running backs yeah. this offseason. So I'm sort of interested to see how that comes together. He, he's got a lot on his hands. There's, there's a lot of talent on that roster. Managing that as a rookie head coach is going to be an interesting exercise, I think, for him. One thing I will say that, uh, to his credit is he, he has gotten fully behind Tua, which I don't think is something that was the case before. I don't think Brian Flores had ever really embraced right. Tua as the quarterback, and certainly publicly he didn't. Um, and, and I do think Mike has, you know, has really thrown his support behind him, and not just in football terms, but in, like, showing it up at his charity events, like, that goes a long way to sort of bolstering the confidence of a young quarterback. Yeah, um, no doubt about but I'm, that. But I'm interested to see what he does with Tua and what he does with that offense. We talked about Zach. We talked about culture. Let's go to the defensive side of the ball. Sauce Gardner, uh, you were in New York when Darrell Rivas was <laughs> at it, his peak. Sauce Gardner, I don't want to put expectations on him, but he kind of has that it that you want at that position, doesn't he? And uh, how do you think he's going to fit into this market? Well, first, he's got a swagger that you yes. want there, right? And I think he'll fit into this market fantastically. He's also, I think everybody is looking at him the way we looked at Durrell, which was, okay, you just go, you take that half of the field, and we don't have to think about that half of the field again for the rest of the day. That's an incredible luxury to have. And look, I mean, this defense obviously needs, speaking of taking steps, I mean, it needs to take a big step up. I, I think the combination of having Sauce Gardner be able to just take this over here um, and maybe finally having a coherent pass rush, pass rushers co with Carl Lawson, hopefully knock on wood, healthy. Right. Um, and Jermaine Johnson, you know, be able to get to the quarterback and get some sacks. Uh, you know, I think the defense can be vastly improved. I mean, you've got to be able to get to the quarterback. You've got to be able to get to Josh Allen. Uh, you know, that's a tough tough boy to bring down he's yes. a big guy um but you you know you've got to be able to affect the quarterback and they haven't been able to do that I, when i looked it up and it was seven seasons with fewer than 40 sacks that's ridiculous uh, i mean you just can't function like that in the nfl you've got to be able to affect the quarterback and so i think the combination of having the rush and then having a sauce gardener back there to lockdown part of the field is, there should be a big improvement on the defense if this team can stop the run on a regular mm -hmm. basis this defense has a chance to be very good right. very good because they do have the pass rushers you talk about loss and you mentioned jermaine johnson they drafted michael clemens in the fourth round mm -hmm. Vinny curry returns you signed jacob martin and free agency but in the middle Guys are going to benefit from that. And uh, the number one guy I think of is Quinn and Williams. Mm -hmm. And the second guy I think of is somebody who actually talked to the media today is John Franklin Myers. Because, yes, you can line them up outside, but then you can shift them inside on passing downs. I think the Jets really could be a terror if you get teams into third and five plus. Right, right. If you can get them into long yardage, then they can tee off. Uh, I go back to the combine where I remember Robert Sala saying something people don't think of, but one way you can help a young quarterback is to have a good defense so that he doesn't wake up every Sunday morning knowing he's going to have to dig the team out of a two-touchdown hole. And that was the case too often last year, right, where, like, before you know it, you were down a touchdown or two, and now Zach Wilson has to climb out. Right. You're not going to win many games like that, but it's also like a terrible mental burden to put on a young quarterback. And so his feeling was we got to keep games close and be able to affect the game on the defensive side of the ball so that it's not 
all on your young quarterback and your young offense. And so I, I, they've certainly gotten better talent-wise. If that comes together, um, I, I, that'll be a huge help to the offense. You talked about the schedule before. What does this team have to be around after nine games where on paper it softens it up post by when you talk about Baltimore coming to town? I went through the AFC North and then I believe the Jets host the Miami Dolphins before a fascinating two game road swing where you're going to Green Bay and then Denver and you're coming back. And I think New England's on a schedule. Buffalo's in the mix there as well. So uh, you can make an argument the Jets' first eight or nine games. Um, awfully difficult, one of the most difficult early season schedules. But with that being said, how much patience do you got to have? Oh, you've got to have <laughs> patience. I mean, <laughs> listen, y you can't do anything if you're going to keep turning over coaches and GMs mm -hmm. and, you know, quarterbacks. I, you you got to give them a long leash to develop You've, again, you've turned over a lot of the roster. Now you have to let those guys play together and come together. You've got to have a lot of patience. I mean, I, you know, every year can't be a Super Bowl year. You've got to build toward yes. a Super Bowl. You, you just enacted almost a complete teardown. Well, now you're building up, and that's fine. <laughs> but it's the buildup, right? I mean, you, you, you don't want to tear it all down again. You've got to let it build. Um, that's one of the things that we were just talking about the Steelers. Like teams like that don't you don't say like after two years, oh, this isn't working. Rip it up. Let's start over again. Right. You just can't do that over and over again. Um, we've seen the Giants do it over and over again, and they know it, it, you, you can't do it. Um, you you got to be patient. It's gonna. It should be a fun team to watch. We talk about no the question. talent increases ac across the board: offense, defense, special teams. Um, and then just thinking about MetLife Stadium, you know, September 11th, Baltimore coming to town. I just feel like this is a young, a young team that could really feed off the energy of this fan base that is so hungry right now. You know, I, I'm not saying they're going to make a run to the Super Bowl the way the Cincinnati Bengals did, but like I look at what the Cincinnati Bengals did, right? And I mean, there are never expectations for the Cincinnati Bengals, right? Now, Joe Burrow is a very great quarterback. But they didn't start last season with everybody in Cincinnati thinking Super Bowl bound. Right. But it built. And especially as the games went on and Burrow got healthier and got stronger, and they were feeding off the energy of I – rem I remember talking to C.J. Uzama when he was on the Bengals yeah. a year ago and him talking about what it was like in town and, like, he'd be out – Walking and like the neighbors would be beeping the horn, like you know, go Bengals, you know, like they they fed on that, and that was a fan base like Jets fans, you know, that are desperate for success, so excited to have success, and they fed off it. There's no question about it. It's it's great when it happens, but you got to give it time, right? I mean, the Bengals fans went through a, a, a lot of tough years too, and but they got the payoff. What will this region? What will New York be like? if this team does turn into a winner, if this team is playing competitive games late in the year? Well, I mean, you and I remember when, like, the Jets went to the playoffs um, in the Herm Edwards years and in the Rex Ryan years, and, and, and even when they were playing meaningful games late and when Todd Bowles was here, um, people get excited, you know? Like, people love a winner in this area. Um, and it, look, it's been I'm not just talking about football, baseball, basketball, like look at how people got into the Rangers run to the mm -hmm. Stanley Cup finals because it had been so long since a New York team had been on a deep postseason run. It, you know, if 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 the Jets get going and and are playing meaningful games into December, there will be real excitement around them. I th think fans got legit love for Joe Douglas and Robert. Sala. No question. Yeah, I, agree. I think Joe D's a badass. I think he's a good talent evaluator. Yes. They like the way he carries himself. Same thing with Salah. Yeah. You're talking about, about his uh, guy in his early 40s, is less than 10% body fat, is still throwing right. the weight around, running the steps all <laughs> right. over the place, right. in great shape, but always positive. And while he's kind of soft-spoken one-on-one, mm -hmm. on that sideline, he lights up. Right. Super intense. I actually think the positivity... Th is a great way to go. Like I, 
like we can all get down, right? You look at the stats and you're like, ah, oh, yeah, that team stinks, that kind of thing. But like, I think like this sort of only positive vibes thing is a, is a good thing and a and a good message for him because he, it's a long season and like things you're gonna have bad days. There's Heck no yeah. question. Players are gonna get hurt. You're gonna lose games you probably shouldn't lose. But I, I think him trying to keep everybody up and saying like, hey, we're we're building, we're we're moving forward. That's that's what you got to remind people of. Like, you just keep moving forward. Perfect example of that is Mikai Becton. You asked Sala yeah. about him yeah. during the news conference. Obviously, this year it's going to be George Fan at left tackle. He played really well there last year, a career year. He wanted to be the left tackle. He is indeed going to be lining up there. Becton just getting his feet underneath him right now because he basically hasn't practiced in a year. But Sala seemed pretty positive when you asked. Yeah, the reason I asked him the question was because during the individual work, Sometimes Becton would be on a knee, and I thought, like, is his conditioning? Like, what's going on there? And that's why I asked. And they were talking, Sala and Becton were talking as they came off the field. And what Sala said in answer to the question was, you know, he had a good day. And what I was talking to him about was, you know, he's getting stronger. He's got to keep pushing himself to the brink of exhaustion because that's how you get stronger physically, right? Yeah. Like, you've got to, you know, you've got to put everything into it. Um, and, and obviously, that's what you want him to do. It's been a long time since he practiced football. He obviously had the weight issues, and now the weight is off, and he's got to build his strength up again. His football, you know, like he's obviously in shape, like by any normal human being standards, but like football shape is not normal right. by any standard. He's got to get into that kind of shape. And I thought that was an interesting comment. Like, you've got to push yourself to the brink of exhaustion because that's how you're going to get stronger. That's how you'll get ready. And I think Sal approaches it that way himself off the field big peloton yeah. guy by the way really not a surprise right not a surprise i'm kind of frightened because i am a peloton girl oh, but like i don't even want to imagine what his output is on those rides. oh you <laughs> like, know he's, oh all, he's always taking it to the brink there's no doubt I cannot about that imagine. Yeah. but but uh, back then again it's a process for him and the team was really encouraged by what happened after mandatory minicamp yeah. where he stayed here he worked with the team trainers and doctors and the nutritionists. And, and it's minus, noticeable. Minus, I mean, it, right. my, yeah, yeah, minus one, obviously. minus a week where July 4th he, he went away. He's been here, yeah. and he does look better. Right. He looks better. Clearly he showed the commitment that he, you know, got his body back together. Right. And now he's just got to get back into, you know, into playing condition. I thought the decision uh, early on to say he's the right tackle so that you're not going back and forth – this is the offensive line. It's set. First of all, I thought that was almost as much about Fant being comfortable at left tackle as it is about, you know, Becton's performance. But I think that that was important for Zach Wilson, too. Like, you cannot be sh – as much as you can avoid it, you don't want to be shuffling that offensive line. You want the offensive line to be able to settle in. Yeah, I think it's huge for the entire team. You right. don't have that uncertainty. People right. don't have to be asked about it all the time. We I mean, know where look, we're going to be at. Just look – what just happened in Tampa with their center, unfortunately, Ryan Jensen yep. going down, possibly season ending injury and like the upheaval that causes like, you, you know, you want to avoid that. And so I thought that the decision like this is our offensive line. This is who's here. This is what we're going forth with. That's it. That was, I thought, really important when you have a young quarterback. Like, Zach Wilson needs to be able to know what's in front of him. All right. We're taping this. So I can't ask you your thoughts on Deshaun Watson because we might have a ruling mm -hmm before i mean by the time this goes up so with that being said you take away deshaun what top couple headlines are you looking at are you following the most closely here this summer national football league was well um i just came from pittsburgh because that's one of the storylines yeah. right who's the quarterback there or, and how quickly do they go to kenny pickett the rookie i don't are the jets gonna be seeing him week four what do you think week gut four my gut says that Mitch Trubisky is going to be the starter coming out of camp. Okay. Um, and I guess we'll see how it goes. But they're in a good position because, you know, they picked Kenny Pickett 20, I think, or in the 20s. And so there's not the same kind of pressure as if he's, you know, the number one overall pick. Sure. Like you, and uh, so they can let him develop. And they've got a really good, you know, Mitch Trubisky is a really good veteran quarterback. Um, so... They're in a good—they can let that play out a little bit. Um, so that's one storyline. 
I, I think we're all looking at, like, how is Russell Wilson going to do in Denver? Because that is a team that was a quarterback away. That's a really good roster that we thought they just need a quarterback. And now you got a quarterback. Yeah. Um, so how does that change the AFC West? If it, Because the AFC West is nuts. That may be the most competitive division we've ever seen in the NFL. Wow. I mean, it's, you know, Patrick Mahomes and Derek Carr and Justin Herbert and Russell Wilson. Like, I think if you asked people, can you rank those one to four? Like, I think how many different answers would you get? Like, well, how do you rank those four? Um, so I'm curious to see what kind of inroads Russell Wilson and the Broncos can make if that upsets the balance in the AFC West. Do they finally topple the Chiefs or, or not? Right. How does losing Tyreek Hill affect the Chiefs or not? How does losing Devontae Adams affect Aaron Rodgers? Or doesn't it? I don't, I don't know. There's been a lot, there was a lot of movement in the offseason of big-time players. And so I'm just sort of interested to see the trickle-down effect of all of that movement. Speaking of Aaron Rodgers, what did you think about his Nicolas Cage <laughs> entry into like, training camp? Is he just having I, fun with people? I, I guess. It's, I just feel like, like Aaron must have a lot of time on his hands. Like, what are we doing? I don't know what's going on. Yes, I think he's just having fun with people, and I think he probably is like, it's another training camp. It's the dog days of summer. Let's have some fun here. But I'm just sort of like, what are what is happening, Aaron? You yeah. know, it's crazy. I don't think I've ever thrown a bag like that before. <laughs> Never. I know. I'm Forget like, the outfit who and the hair. Who's over? Like, did somebody? And then who is the poor person who has to go scurry after and get the bag? Like, I just needed to play out that whole thing. I wanted to see the rest of, like, what you know, team official had to go get Aaron's bag. <laughs> so you have an interesting itinerary because you'll be here for back to football Saturday and then down to see. Tom Brady and the Buccaneers and our former head coach here with the Jets, Todd Bowles, TB, a great opportunity for him, right? An incredible opportunity and like a rare opportunity. Let's face it, most coaches are hired because the team is is bad, right? And you've fired a coach. And so most new coaches are taking over a roster that's not very good and maybe you're rebuilding. And obviously that's not the case in Tampa. I mean, you could not... I mean, you're, you couldn't land in a better spot. I'm, I'm thrilled for him. I'm so happy for him that he's getting this opportunity. And, um, I mean, he's obviously got a Super Bowl caliber team um, yeah. right now. We'll see what the Ryan Jensen situation means. But, um, you know, it's, it's a great opportunity for Todd, and I'm thrilled for him. Last question. I love the Buccaneers' creamsicles uniforms. What did you think about the Jets' release of the black helmet? I like the black helmet. Okay. I echo uh, the longtime Jets fans who want those that old Jets logo, you know, the, whatever, the 1980s, I yeah. guess. Like, I love, I love, like, the old throwback stuff. So I hope that they do a spin through those, too, for the Jets. But I like the black stuff. I like all the alternate. I, I liked most of them that came out this year. I think you're not alone about the Jets throwbacks. We'll have to yeah. see what happens in the future. Like, here. I love those old ones from, like, I'm trying to, you know, like, it must have been the 80s, yeah, right? Yeah, the, like the sack exchange days. Right, the sack exchange, right? Like, yep. those, I love those old uniforms, and I advocate all teams going no, back. So to I lied about the last question. Joe Klecko, should <gasps> he be in the Hall of Fame? I hope, He's a I senior hope he, finalist. Yeah, I hope or, he makes it. He's at 12. We're going to cut that right. list down to three here. I soon. hope he makes it. I hope he makes it. And Revis, first ballot? First ballot is so much about, and I am not a Hall of Fame voter, right. but first ballot is so much about who else is on the ballot and are there people in there who've been waiting on that ballot who've been waiting a long time and do they feel like they have to get those guys in? Um, so I think it's tough. I mean, do I think what, you know, when we hear first ballot, that means was he an incredibly dominant player? Yeah, obviously he was an incredibly dominant player um, and he will be in the Hall of Fame. Will he be a first ballot Hall of Famer? I don't know. I, I don't know. It's I'll see when we see what the you know final count, yeah. what the final cut is down to the ballot. But you're right. It's yeah, it's who you're going against. It's so much. I remember this the first time Gronk yeah. retired before he came back. But the first time Gronk yeah, retired, retired, people said, is he a first ballot Hall of Famer? And I'm like, I understand what you're saying. Yes, he was a dominant. <laughs> he was certainly the best of his era. Maybe the best ever. But so much of first ballot is about who else is on the ballot. And, for instance, if you, if you retired in a year that top quarterbacks happened to retire, uh, yeesh, because the quarterbacks are almost certainly going to get in. Um, so it's tough. So we'll see who else is on the ballot when Revis is up. But he's going to be in the Hall of Fame, if not 
on the first ballot, then second year, third year, he'll be there. Yeah, so maybe Joe Klecko this year. That would be fantastic. Maybe Javarrell Revis in 2023. And Judy Batista says things are looking up for the 2022 New York Jets. It was great seeing you. Great to be here. Thanks for having me.